The Chronicles of Prydane by Lloyd Alexander. Book Two, The Black Cauldron. Chapter 10, The Marshes of Morva. From the moment the marsh bird appeared, Tarn led the companions swiftly, following without hesitation a path which now seemed clear. He felt the powerful muscles of Melendless moving beneath him and guided the steed with unaccustomed skill. The stallion responded to this new touch on the reins with mighty bursts of speed, so much so that Leluger could barely keep pace. Fluider shouted for Tarn to halt a bit and let them all catch their breath. Gurgi, looking like a wind-blown haystack, gratefully clambered down, and even Ilanwe gave a sigh of relief. Since we've stopped, Tarn said, Gurgi might as well share out some food, but we'd better find shelter first if we don't want to get soaked. Soaked? cried Fluider. Great belly! There isn't a cloud in the sky! It's a gorgeous day! Taking everything into consideration! If I were you, Ilanwe advised the puzzled bard, I should listen to him. Usually that's not a wise thing to do, but the circumstances are a little different now. The bard shrugged and shook his head, but followed Taran across the rolling fields into a shallow ravine. There they found a wide and fairly deep recess in the shoulder of a hill. I hope you aren't wounded, remarked Fluider. My war leader at home has an old wound that gives him a twinge when the weather changes. Very handy, I admit, though it does seem a painful way of foretelling rain. I always think it's easier just to wait, and every kind of weather is bound to come along sooner or later. The wind has shifted, Taran said. It comes from the sea now. It's restless with a briny taste. There's a smell of grass and weeds, too, which makes me think we aren't far from Morva. If all goes well, we may reach the marshes by tomorrow. Soon afterward, the sky indeed clouded over, and a chill rain began pelting against the hill. In moments, it grew to a heavy downpour. Water coursed in rivulets on either side of their shelter, but the companions remained dry. Wise master, shouted Gurgi, protects us from slippings and drippings. I must say, the bard remarked, you foretold it exactly. Not I, said Taran. Without a Dayon's clasp, I'm afraid we'd all have been drenched. How's that? asked the perplexed fluider. I shouldn't think a clasp would have anything to do with it. As he had explained to Ilanway, Taran now told the bard what he had learned of the brooch. Fluider cautiously examined the ornament at Taran's throat. Very interesting, he said. Whatever else it may be, it bears the bardic symbol. Those three lines there, like a sort of arrowhead. I saw them, Tarn said, but I didn't know what they were. Naturally, said Fluider. It's part of the secret lore of the bards. I learned that much when I was trying to study for my examinations. But what do they mean? Tarn asked. As I recall, put in Ilanway, the last time I asked him to read an inscription, Yes, said Fluider with an embarrassment. That was something else again, but I know the bardic symbol well. It is secret, though since you have the clasp, I don't suppose it can do any harm for me to tell you. The lines mean knowledge, truth, and love. That's very nice, said Ilanwe, but I can't imagine why knowledge, truth, and love should be so much of a secret. Perhaps I should say unusual as much as secret, explained the bard. I sometimes think it's hard enough to find any one of them, even separately. But put all together, and you have something very powerful indeed. Tarn, who had been thoughtfully fingering his clasp, stopped and looked about him uneasily. Hurry, he said, we must leave here at once. Tarn of Cairdalbin, Elanway cried, you're going too far. I can understand coming out of the rain, but I don't see deliberately going into it. Nevertheless, she followed, and the companions at Tarn's urgent command untethered the horses and ran from the hillside. They had not gone ten paces before the entire slope, weakened by the downpour, collapsed with a loud roar. Gurgi yelped in terror and threw himself at Tarn's feet. Oh, great, brave, and wise master! Gurgi is thankful! His poor tender head is spared from terrible dashings and crashings. Fluider put his hands on his hips and gave a low whistle. 
Well, well, fancy that. Another moment and we'd have been buried for good and all. Never part with that clasp, my friend. It's a true treasure. Tarn was silent. His hand went to Adeon's brooch, and he stared at the shattered hill slope with a look of wonder. The rain slackened a little before nightfall. Although drenched and chilled to the bone, the companions had made good progress by the time Tarn allowed them to rest again. Here, gray and cheerless moors spread before them. Wind and water had worn crevices in the earth, like the gouging of a giant's fingers. The companions made their camp in a narrow gorge, glad for the chance to sleep even on the muddy ground. Tarin drowsed with one hand on the iron brooch, the other grasping his sword. He was less weary than he had expected, despite the grueling ride. A strange sense of excitement thrilled him, different from what he had felt when Dalbin had presented him with the sword. However, his dreams that night were troubled and unhappy. At first light, as the companions began their journey again, Tarin spoke of his dreams to Ilanwe. I can make no sense of them, he said with hesitation. I saw Eladir in mortal danger. At the same time, it was though my hands were bound and I could not help him. I'm afraid the only place you're going to see Eladir is in your dreams, replied Ilanwe. There certainly hasn't been a trace of him anywhere. For all we know, he could have been to Morva and gone, or not even reached the marshes in the first place. It's too bad you didn't dream of an easier way to find that cauldron and put an end to all of this. I'm cold and wet, and at this point I'm beginning not to care who has it. I dreamed of the cauldron, too, Tarn said anxiously. But everything was confused and clouded. It seems to me we came upon the cauldron, and yet, he added, when we found it, I wept. Ilanwe, for once, was silent, and Tarn had no heart to speak of the dream again. Shortly after midday, they reached the marshes of Morva. Tarin had sensed them long before, as the ground had begun to turn spongy and treacherous under the hooves of Malenless. He had seen more marsh birds and had heard, far in the distance, the weird and lonely voice of a loon. Ropes of fog, twisting and creeping like white serpents, had begun to rise from the reeking ground. Now the companions halted and stood in silence at a narrow neck of the swamp. From there, the marshes of Morva stretched westward to the horizon. Here, huge growths of thorny firs rose up. At the far side, Tarn distinguished meager clumps of wasted trees. Under the gray sky, pools of stagnant water flickered among dead grasses and broken reeds. A scent of ancient decay choked his nostrils. A ceaseless thrumming and groaning trembled in the air. Gurgi's eyes were round with terror, and the bard shifted uneasily on Leluger. You've led us here well enough, said Ilanwe. But how do you ever expect to go about finding a cauldron in a place like this? Tarin motioned her to be silent. As he looked across the dreaded marshes, something stirred in his mind. Do not move, he cautioned in a low voice. He glanced quickly behind him. Gray shapes appeared from the line of bushes str strangling over a hillock. They were not two wolves, as he had thought at first, but two huntsmen in jackets of wolf pelts. Another huntsman in a heavy cloak of bearskin crouched beside them. The huntsmen have found us, Tarn went on quickly. Follow every step I take, but not a motion until I give the signal. Now he understood the dream of the wolves clearly, and he knew exactly what he must do. The huntsmen, believing they could take their prey unawares, drew closer. Now, shouted Tarn. He urged Melendless forward and galloped headlong into the marshes. Heaving and plunging, the stallion labored through the mire. With a great shout, the huntsmen raced after him. Once, Melendless nearly foundered in a deep pool. The great strides of the pursuers brought them closer, so close that a fearful backward glance. Tarn saw one of them, teeth bared in a snarl, reach out to catch the stirrups of Leluger. Tarn spun Melendless to the right. Leluger followed. A shout of terror rose behind them. One of the men clad in wolfskin had stumbled and pitched forward, screaming as the black bog seized and sucked him down. His two comrades grappled each other, striving desperately to flee the ground that fell away under their feet. The huntsman in bearskin flung out his arms and scrambled at the weeds, growling in rage. The last warrior trampled the sinking man, vainly seeking a foothold to escape the deadly bog. Melendless galloped onward, brackish water spurted at his hooves. But Tarn guided the powerful stallion along what seemed a chain of submerged islands, never stopping even when he reached the far side of the swamp. 
There, on more solid ground, he raced through the firs and beyond the clump of trees. While the Luger pounded after him, Tarn followed a long gully towards the protection of a high mound. Suddenly, he reined in the stallion. At the side of the mound, almost a part of the turf itself, rose a low cottage. It was so cleverly concealed with sod and branches that Tarn had to look again to see there was a doorway. Circling the hill were tumbled down stables and something resembling a demolished chicken roost. Tarn began to back Malinless away from this strange cluster of buildings and cautioned the others to keep silent. I shouldn't worry about that, Ilanway said. Whoever lives in there surely heard us coming. If they aren't out to welcome us or fight us by now, then I don't think anyone's there at all. She leaped from Malinless and made her way toward the cottage. Come back, Tarn called. He unsheathed his sword and followed her. The bard and Gurgi dismounted and drew their own weapons. Alert and cautious, Tarn approached the low doorway. Ilanwe had discovered a window, half hidden by turf and grass, and was peering through it. I don't see anybody, she said as the others came up beside her. Look for yourself. For the matter of that, said the bard, ducking his head and squinting past Ilanwe. I don't think anyone's been here for quite some time. So much the better. In any case, we'll have a dry place to rest. The chamber, Tarn saw, indeed seemed deserted, of inhabitants at least, for the room was even more heaped and disorderly than Dalwyn's. In one corner stood a wide loom with a good many of the threads straggling down. The work on the frame was less than half finished and so tangled and knotted he could imagine no one ever continuing it. Broken crockery covered a small table. Rusted and broken weapons were piled about. How would you like it? Asked a cheerful voice behind Tarin. If you were turned into a toad and stepped on.